Dr. Frankie Jackson Spence, medical doctor, doing a PhD, works in cancer clinical trials. She's a marathon runner. She's a qualified personal trainer. You do so many things. It's nice to have some uninterrupted time in the diary. Did you always want to be a doctor? I actually used to always want to go into business, but I always loved science. Tell me the good and bad. A lot of the studies we have on women's health are based on male data. I know you're going to like me talking about testosterone. You and I can't get through a conversation without jostling about hormones. If exercise were a drug, it would be the most widely prescribed drug of all time. What tips have you got for sleeping better? Lose that narrative that sleep is lazy. You're making me want to go to bed right now. Hopefully not because I'm boring. <laughs> <laughs> you into ice baths? I did go in the sea on Christmas Day. Let's talk about the glamorous stuff. The negative feedback I got was always from doctors. I'm doing something that's not the norm. Are you Ed saying you're an attractive, articulate, educated doctor? I think you said that to me before I came <laughs> on. Wasn't that written on your introduction? <laughs> Tell me how it all began. Guys, Matt Haycock's here, and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycock Show, where today I've got a good friend as a guest a guest here today. I've got Dr. Frankie Jackson-Spence. She's been promising me this podcast for a, for a good year or so now, so hopefully we're going to make the most of it. Frankie is a medical doctor. She's doing a PhD. She works in cancer clinical trials. She's a marathon runner. She's a qualified personal trainer. I better stop now. I'm going to be giving her a big head. <laughs> but she's uh, she's got lots of things we can talk about to do with with medicine, with influencing, with, uh, with health and fitness and stuff in general. So I'm excited to have you here. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And I always like talking to friends on here as well because it just has a different, uh, more relaxed dynamic. Like I'd certain, I was just saying to you before we started, I was recording with um, Vanessa Feltz this morning and uh, she, um, I guess, talking to someone who, A, I don't know and with like 30 years of broadcast journalism experience, she uh, she made me feel like... Um, I don't, not nervous, but certainly certainly not relaxed. So I couldn't be sat there with my grenade bar and my um, <laughs> and my um, my coconut bits and bobs. Well, but it's, it's nice to have some uninterrupted time in the diary. <laughs> well, it's just a shame I had to book you for a podcast to get it. <laughs> so listen, um, you do so many things. Tell me how it all began. How did it all begin? So I finished medical school about five years ago now. And when I was at medical school, I was there for six years. So a really long time. And it's really expensive. So any kind of future doctors out there, that's just something to consider. Being at university as a student for six years um, was kind of taking its toll financially and also getting a little bit repetitive. So I got um, very interested in research and that's what I do now, cancer research. But I also got into fitness as kind of a way to de-stress, to like look after my mental well-being. But I also got really curious with why we train the way we do. So I would see things saying you should do this many reps or this type of exercise. And I was questioning why. So I started to look up like the papers behind the types of training we do. And then I also did my personal training qualifications. And I started posting all of the things I was learning about online, which kind of tied into my kind of academic medicine nature, because it's just what I'm like. I wouldn't take anything um, at face value, I always ask like, kind of what is the research and what's the evidence behind it? And the same applied to my training. So I started sharing that journey on social media. Um, I qualified as a PT and I started doing online coaching and personal training to kind of fund myself through university. Um, it was a hobby and an interest, but I started to realize I could have a bit of a side business, which kept me interested and also made being a student a little bit more comfortable. So that was kind of seven, eight years ago. And then when I graduated as a doctor, I kind of had that slap of reality where I'd been telling everyone, you know, you can train four or five times a week, an hour and a half in the gym. And actually I realized that working full time, it wasn't quite that easy. And actually being a student, you had so much free time. Um, and so I kind of turned away from that really like set in stone workout regime, um, going to the gym and just kind of tried to fit fitness into working as a junior doctor. Um, and then my content kind of changed with that. F fitness wasn't really my life anymore. It was just kind of part of it. Um, and then I also started to learn more as a doctor, you know, working and developing my academic career. And I started sharing all that other stuff and it kind of evolved naturally into that. Cool. Well, look, just going back to the very beginning, because you started um, when you'd gone to uni. I mean, mm. did you always want to be a doctor? And I guess now we know about your passion for fitness. Did, did, you, did you have any interest in fitness as a kid? So the question of did I always want to be a doctor, that is an interesting one. Probably not until I was about 
15, 16. I actually used to always want to go into business. Um, you know, my mum through business, she was always a big inspiration of mine. And I always thought I would set up my own business. What doing? I don't know. I never really got that far. I just always had been a bit entrepreneurial. Like when I was 10, I had a dog walking business and I would knock on people's doors and, you know, try and make money or um, selling bracelets in the school playground and things like that. So I thought that's what I'd do. But I always loved science. And it was actually a teacher at my school who said, I think you'd be great doing medicine. You love science. You love problem solving. And you're a people person. Um, so it was actually kind of that guidance from school that taught me to do medicine as a degree. And I'm really glad I did. Now I can't imagine doing anything else. But I also think that's because I've molded the medicine career slightly more into the business side of things. And um, so, no, I haven't always wanted to be a doctor. And similarly, you asked about... If you're always into fitness. I've always been into fitness. So not in the way I am now, but I was always an active child. So I would play more sports, um, netball, tennis or literally just playing on the street. You know, when I was 12, 13, we were rollerblading on the street or running around, not like um, teenagers now on TikTok. And <laughs> we were like doing physical activity. So yeah, I guess I've always been active, but definitely not so much into fitness until university when actually I got into it more for like the mental benefits. So a few things I think we can talk about here. So when you um, you say you wanted to do the, the kind of medical research on, on the fitness side of things, mm. where, where did you turn to for that research and how do you know what you decide to believe in? And, and I guess ask that from, we can talk from a fitness perspective, from a medical perspective, in, 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 every, in every sector now where, where we've got so much information, so much misinformation, you know, there'll be someone telling you that, you know, doing 20 reps of an exercise is the optimum thing. Someone tell you that running is going to make you live longer. Someone tell you running is going to make you make you live five years less. How do you know what the right information is? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because for me, I'm an academic medic. So my day-to-day -day job is doing medical research. I'm currently studying for a PhD. And so I know how to critically appraise the literature that's published on scientific databases like PubMed. So I can actually go to the paper and I have the skills to critically appraise that, look at kind of what research me methods they use, what statistical analysis they did. I have those skills. But I think it's really difficult for the average person who wants to learn a bit more about um, why we eat a certain way or why someone's telling me to do that kind of exercise or why someone's telling me to you know focus on my gut microbiome. That's more difficult. Um, and that's kind of where I feel like pages like mine step in because I hope to bridge that gap between me reading the papers and then kind of reproducing that and um, showcasing that research in a more digestible way, in a more accessible way, because not everyone has those transferable skills where you can literally go to the experiment that was done um, and, you know, say why we do those things. You know, there's um, evidence, if I pick one example, that regular exercise reduces your risk of brain aging. So the re reduces the risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. Whereas I've read the paper that shows, you know, the mice studies um, showing that regular exercise increases the size of your hippocampus or your prefrontal cortex in your brain. And that's protective against Using Alzheimer's. Some big words now. Yeah. So it's just, you see what I mean? It's like, I can then read that, digest that, and then pre um, present it in a way that's exercise reduces your risk of developing Alzheimer's, which is easy for everyone to understand. So yeah, I learned those skills through medical school and also through my five years of doing academic medicine. So if you're talking to someone to promote the benefits of exercise, mm. I mean, what, what's what's your strategy for some for someone who's, you know, let's say not taking it in or someone who clearly needs to, needs to take exercise into, into their life? And I guess mm. I'm asking that pretty from my, my own perspective as someone who's, I've always... I've always been into exercise to a degree, but much more heavily so over the, over the last couple of years. And you know, I I think for me, being being in shape or even not being in shape, but certainly exercising, even you know, no matter whether or not it translates to being in shape, is absolutely fundamental. Yeah for for success in whatever you want to do because you know if if you if you haven't got your health and fitness uh you know you you, you can't concentrate properly at work or you can't you know hang out and keep up with your kids or whatever it is you want to do you know that that exercise is, is so fundamental for it and 
And I try and keep everything super simplified and you know, a load of those fancy words you've just been talking about, <laughs> hypermiscuses or whatever, I wouldn't even know where to begin. But, you know, for me, I think ultimately it's about, you know, have, having a diet that is semi-sensible. Like, you know, like I don't calorie count and things just because I know it doesn't, it doesn't really suit me, you know. Uh, it's so fashionable nowadays to bang on about all oh, giving up giving up booze. Mm. You know, I'm never going to give up booze because uh, I, I, know, I know you're not <laughs> and anyone who follows Frankie on, 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 on social media will know that she'll never give up champagne. But, uh, you know, I, I don't feel I need to give it up because yeah. I don't have some problem to mm. achieve by giving up. But I also, I also know that, you know, it's better for me when I don't drink, but I want to have that flexibility to have it in. So, you know, I think I eat semi-sensibly, you know, I find exercise that I enjoy mm. and kind of hammer the life out of it because then it's not really like doing exercise. It's, it's, it's doing something fun that I want to do. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, I mean, yeah, that, that's it. That's it really. You know, find exercise that I enjoy doing, do as much of it as I can eat semi-sensibly and everything else you know, kind of falls into place. But it seemed, I think, Everybody seems to, not everybody, the people who can't get into it, overcomplicate it. There's always, and now whether or not they're overcomplicating it, just to use it as an excuse and say, oh, well, I, I need to get all these things in, in yeah. place. Just like in the same way that people who talk about starting a business don't start it because they procrastinate because they want to get all the right pieces in place. But again, it's not that they really want to get perfection. It's just that they want to make excuses so, so they yeah. don't start. And all these people who, you know, who've been on a diet for the last 30 years, you know, you don't have a, you know, you don't have a thyroid problem. You don't have a slow metabolism. You're just fucking lazy. You know, it's, it's, if you want to lose weight, walk, walk more, run more and eat less food. Uh, but you're going to be a lot more polite and, uh, <laughs> and medical about it than me. So come on, g g give some tips. I think the barriers to exercise and proper nutrition are a little bit more complex than people being lazy. We can, you know, really delve into that. There's lots of reasons, but... I think when it comes to exercise, I actually posted a video on this today. People focus on the small stuff when they haven't even got the fundamentals in place. Like if you are not even moving your body, then it doesn't matter the type of exercise you're doing. It just matters that you're doing it. So you could um, say to me, I need to get into fitness. And then you think, All right, I've got to sign up to a gym. I've got to go look around the gym. I've got to be able to afford it. I've got to buy the workout kit. I've got to get a PT. I've got to learn the exercises. You don't need to do all that. It could be as simple as I'm going to establish exercise into my routine. Okay. I need to set aside three time slots in my week where I go on a walk. And it starts with that. And that's better than nothing. Also from a health perspective, a bad workout literally does not exist. So we all have days in the gym where everything re feels really heavy or your head's not in it. You can't lift as much or um, you're a bit sluggish or, you know, I run a lot. And some days I'll have really awful runs where my pace is really slow and I'm comparing. But actually what's going on in your body physiologically is like so many wonderful things that it really doesn't matter. The, all those things are kind of ego related or aesthetic related. So all the benefits of exercise to name a few, you know, improved blood pressure, improved blood glucose. So reducing your risk of diabetes, reducing your risk of cancers, honestly, name a disease, exercise helps prevent it. Um, they are all there independent of your BMI. So if you're not losing weight and you're not seeing your body change or you've not got you know, the six pack you want, the exercise is still benefiting. And I think people forget that. So they lose motivation because something you mentioned, they're either doing a form of exercise that they don't enjoy and they feel like is a chore, or they are focusing too much on these superficial benefits of exercise when really the ones that are, you know, the most um, productive to your long-term health, you can't even see. You know, you can't see if your blood pressure is getting better or your blood glucose control is getting better. But I think as well, in terms of talking about, you know, exercises that you enjoy, it's, it's a point that you could, it's almost worth us doing to death because you can never overdo it to death. No. That, that how important it is to find something, because people always say to me, like, you know, what's the best form of exercise? And I always say the best form of exercise is whatever you like the most because it's what you're going to be the most consistent at. Yeah. Now, I hate rowing, absolutely despise mm. rowing. And you won't get me to do more than 30 seconds of it. But, you know... Ask me to do boxing, ask me to play tennis, 
I mean, not run out. I do running more because I have to do it. But anything like boxing, tennis, those kind of things, I almost don't even think of it as exercise. Mm. I'm gonna go and I, I just want to go and play a game yeah. of tennis, or I want to go and go and do some boxing, and I can just you know do it forever and ever and ever. Mm. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's so important to find what you like. I think also once you start to exercise, you also realise in the same way that you've said you can't do a bad workout. It's also impossible to finish a workout not feeling happier than when you started. Mm. I, I'm sure you've got all the science behind it, but <laughs> I, I, I just know that from a, a layman's perspective, you always walk, you might walk out of the gym tired. I'm like, oh, but you definitely walk out with some kind of a smile on your face and, yeah. and, and feel, feeling better than, than not doing it before. I mean, I guess as someone who posts a lot about this kind of stuff, you must get lots of obviously lots of questions and comments sent to you on social media. What I mean, what are the kind of questions that the the man or the woman on the street is saying to you about? You know why? why they can't why they're struggling to exercise or what kind of what kind of advice are they asking for you in that arena lots of people ask like you said what's the best form of exercise and the answer to that is what you said the one that you enjoy and you can sustain these whole like you know six week programs or three month programs are kind of useless because what happens at the end of that period you need something that doesn't feel like a chore. Sometimes I think it's good to push yourself out of your comfort zone. I certainly do some exercises, you know, yours is rowing, mine is like the ski erg in the gym, which feel awful and I don't enjoy, but I like the kind of discipline that comes with doing them. Um, but yeah, doing, so the best form of exercise, doing the one you enjoy. People saying, you know, why can't I lose weight? I think that's a really complex question. I think we overestimate the benefits of exercise for weight loss and underestimate how much impact nutrition has. You know, if you exercise for one hour a day, it's a small proportion of your day, whereas the rest of the day you spend a lot of time eating and drinking. Um, I think that's complex. I think as a kind of nation, we do eat the wrong things. There's so much convenience food. Um, there's so much culture around eating out, isn't there? Like, you know, we love eating out. It's social. It means you don't know how it's cooked. It's probably loads of butter and things to make it extra delicious. Um, and you probably have a glass of wine with it, which is kind of extra calories that don't fill you up. So there's complex questions about um, what's the best way to eat is. But I think if someone isn't seeing any progress, they either need to be real with themselves about what they're doing when they're not in the gym, because you can be pushing yourself as hard as you want, but you can do undo some of your progress um, outside of the gym, if we're talking about weight loss. Um, have a look at kind of what they're eating um, and be real about that. And then look at other things like, are you getting enough sleep? There's all these hidden things to do with our health that I think contribute to your overall um, health, you know, physiological well-being. So are you getting enough sleep? You can be training all you want and eating um, a healthy, nutritious diet. But if you're sleeping five hours a night instead of seven hours a night, that's undoing some of that hard work. Managing stress. I think is a huge one, particularly in our day and age. I was thinking about this queuing for the post office the other day and I was doing all my emails and I thought to myself, you know, there was a time when I would kind of just daydream in the post office, which I think is important sometimes to just have mental breaks in the day um, and methods of coping with stress. So I think a lot of people ask me, you know, about those, what are the pillars of health? It isn't just about exercise. It's about nutrition. It's about sleep. It's about stress. It's about social engagements and relationships. <laughs> I was, I was, no, no, I wasn't going to interrupt. I was gonna, yeah, I was... so it's often a lot more complex than people want to believe. Everyone wants a quick fix. But obviously, and I'm, I'm conscious of anything I say not to contradict, contradict you from a medical perspective. But yes, you're, pretty, you're right in so far as there's so many more things to it. But I think as well, because I do like to bring things down to its simplest point, as important as all of those other bits are, and you're completely right, they are for optimum. The simple fact is, if you exercise more and eat less, you've got to, you've got to be get, getting results. And like, and you said something in there like you need to look at yourself or you need need, need yeah. to take a look. But at those yourself. results are aesthetic. So you know, if you exercise more and eat less, you might lose body fat. But actually, we talked about you know the benefits of exercise are independent of mm -hmm. that. So if we're talking about we're exercising to reduce our risk of heart disease or cancer in the future, it's not just exercise and nutrition. So yeah, I think weight loss and health are different parameters and often people measure their health by what they look like. But, you know, if you think about some of the magazines I grew up reading, the girls on the cover Smash of the magazines, hits. no, no, I don't think so. Things like, you know, Vogue or OK Magazine, all of these ones where you have a beautiful woman on the front page in great shape, but that doesn't 
necessarily tell you anything about how healthy she is, that she could have a eating disorder. She could um, have, you know, mental health issues. She might have some endocrine problems. She might have fertility issues. Um, there's loads of things you can't see based on what you look like. And so I think it's a little bit superficial to say exercise more and eat less because you do need to consider the other aspects. Lots of men I know you're going to like me talking about testosterone. Well, I was about to say Exercise. to you. Honestly, I was about to say to you. I know, we're not, I know I promise not to talk about anything controversial with you, but, but you know, you and I can't get through a conversation without jostling about hormones. So you don't have to, just have to talk about testosterone. We can talk hormones in so general. Exercise for men can increase your testosterone, okay? Body fat, um, having more adipose tissue, increases your level of estrogen, the female hormone. So if a man wants to boost his testosterone and lower his estrogen, exercising more and lowering body fat is going to help that. But what I think is really interesting is if you sleep for five hours at night instead of the recommended seven to nine hours, men that sleep five hours a night have a testosterone level comparable to men 10 to 15 years their senior. So a 30-year-old man could have lower testosterone levels than a 45-year-old man because they're not sleeping enough. And so when you, you know, you're making me want to go to bed right now. When you, hopefully not because I'm boring. <laughs> um, when you, so when you see stats like that, you realize how important sleep is. You know, sleeping less than six hours a night has been shown to increase your risk of heart disease by 300%. So it's, you can't escape those things, but we, people don't like talking about them because you can't see it. So it's not as sexy to talk about. People like talking about, you know, the dream body and the big biceps and things. And in terms in terms of hormones, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know how, how much it's your area of knowledge or expertise. Uh, and I know, obviously, in the UK, we've got a lot less access to access to this kind of stuff than than elsewhere. But obviously, as you know, and it's no secret anyway, I talk about it on my podcast. You know, I, I started um, uh, TRT testosterone replacement therapy last April, um, seeing a doctor over there. Uh, and you know, I mean, I always say that I, you know, I'm the kind of uh, PR guy for uh, you know for for any kind of hormone uh, rebalancing and stuff now. And I think you know, it'll be whether it'll be in the UK. I don't know, but you know the whole concept of of TRT of of growth hormone of all that kind of stuff will be as commonplace in five years' time as as Botox is now or you know, something like that. I mean, I don't know how how much you know exposure and knowledge to it you have, but um, anything you can talk about. I don't know necessarily if it will become um, kind of common practice because two things, it, you know, it, healthcare in this country often comes down to cost. And so it probably won't become something that's like NHS, particularly in this country. Um, I but think from a private perspective? Potentially from a private perspective. I'm not sure about kind of supplementing hormones, but I think that the topic of hormones is becoming really trendy. I can speak more from a female health perspective. I've definitely got an interest in that. A lot of the studies we have on women's health are based on male data. So up until 1993, women were excluded from clinical trials, which means that all of the drugs we've tested, all of the diseases we learn about have been studied on men. And I think we're learning more and more and more research is being published in that space. You know, the impact female hormones throughout their menstrual cycle is going to impact day-to-day -day living and, you know, diseases. Um, and so I think Hormones in general is becoming much trendy, much more trendy, and more research will be published on that. So I think in five years' time, yeah, the landscape of kind of us studying our hormones and potentially supplementing um, and correcting those will probably will become a thing. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'll, uh, I'll completely butcher it from a from a layman's perspective. But uh, you know, the, the the doctor I see over in Dubai, uh, I mean, I've again, I've been doing his PR from as well. Must must have sent him. I'm not joking. Thirty five of my mates, you know, to 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 go and see him, and I've I've sent sent him a couple of guys who. Um, you know, were grossly overweight. Uh, I mean, like, like like grossly, grossly overweight, and <laughs> I, I know from the time I've spent with them. I mean, I don't know what goes on totally behind closed doors, but I know they don't eat ridiculous amounts. I know they, I know they do do some working out, but you know they're still twenty stone, you know, twenty stone guys, twenty one stone stone guys. Uh, and I remember taking them to, uh, you know, to, to see this doctor, saying, "Look, you know." Have a, have a chat, see what you can do. And, and they say, look, I'm trying to lose weight. You know, this is what I eat and, and this is what I exercise. And his view, and again, he's, a bit, he's probably a bit brash and over-simplistic as well, but he'll turn around and say, you know, looks at the hormones and goes, 
well, with hormone levels like this, you know, you can exercise all you want. You can eat, you can eat fucking air, but you're never going to lose any weight because, you know, your testosterone is so low or your other bits and pieces are, are, are so, so out of kilter mm. that um, it's, it's almost it's almost mm. impossible to lose weight. But it's a vicious cycle, isn't it? Because like I just mentioned, fat tissue produces estrogen. So you're then in this vicious cycle where the more weight you gain and the more fat tissue you hold, you produce more estrogen, which lowers your testosterone levels, which then makes it harder to lose weight. And it, you go round and round like this. So I think, you know, whenever we're talking about medicine, we need to be combining lifestyle changes and medical intervention. Um, if I have a patient that's got high blood pressure, I won't just say to them, you need to take this blood pressure tablet to lower it. I'll say, here's the blood pressure tablet to lower it in the meantime, so that you're at a safer level. But you also need to have a look at your activity levels, stress levels, sleep, diet, that kind of thing. So it's all, you know, it's one part of the jigsaw. Sure. Uh, so sleep, we talked about sleep a minute ago, obviously being a big big part of the jigsaw as well. Yeah. I mean, what, um, what tips or advice have you got for sleeping better? I love that question. I honestly could talk the whole hour about sleep. It's something I'm definitely interested in. I used to be someone who really thought of sleep as being lazy. You know, if I slept in on a weekend, I'd think I've wasted part of the day. There's so much to be doing. Um, and actually, I think the first step to getting better sleep is to allow yourself to get better sleep and to lose that narrative that sleep is lazy. You know, we live in a culture where there's sayings, you can sleep when you're dead or no rest for the wicked. And you see lots of um, influential figures saying they sleep four hours a night. But actually, once you learn the detrimental effects of um, sleep deprivation on your health and the positive effects of sleeping, it changes your whole mindset. And just to put that into perspective, you know, your audience on this podcast are lots of entrepreneurs. Look at the big companies like Google that have um, put sleep pods into their office or Nike headquarters in America have um, relaxation rooms and flexible working hours so you can um, work in accordance to your circadian rhythm, so your sleep pattern, or um, P&G also have some sleep policies, I can't remember off the top of my head. That's because there was a study in the UK that showed because we're not sleeping enough, it costs a nation like 2% GDP, which in the UK is like 40 billion pounds a year. And that's because not having enough sleep um, suppresses your immune system. Sleeping one night, just five hours, reduces your amount of um, a certain immune cell by 70%. So you're more likely to pick up the common cold. That's where the saying run down comes from. And therefore more likely to take sick days off work. Um, it reduces your concentration, ability to problem solve. It even, sleep deprivation even influences the way that you can interact with people. So your ability to pick up social cues. So you might be at a business meeting or recording a podcast with someone. And if you're poorly slept, the rapport might not be as good, which is, you know, going to have lasting impact. And so that's just kind of one avenue of why sleep deprivation is so, you know, such a big issue. You, we're in an obesity epidemic, but you could argue that we're in a um, sleep loss epidemic. I think the stat was that two thirds of the population don't get the recommended um, seven to nine hours sleep a night. Sleep also has a massive impact on your risk of developing diseases. I mentioned before about increasing your risk of developing heart disease, cancers. It increases your risk of um, developing neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's. Increases your risk of mental health conditions. If you think about how you feel after one or two bad nights sleep, you feel ratty and irritable and you know a bit more low. If that's a chronic thing, that increases your risk of mental health disease like actual anxiety or depressive states and so honestly the benefits of sleep um are endless and i think we we really neglect it we stay up late food prepping or we get up early to exercise and actually making time for yourself to sleep seven to nine hours a night consistently is one of the best things you can do for your health I called a member of staff about two weeks ago and she was uh, she was having a nap at 11 o'clock in the morning. If I'd have only spoken to you before, I might have been more em empathetic <laughs> and been not fired her. <laughs> Honestly, I read some studies that a 20-minute <laughs> afternoon nap, no longer, is actually really good for boosting your productivity in the afternoon. So, you know, being more alert, being better at problem solving. Well, 
I had um, I, I went to a seminar uh, a couple of years back, and there was a guy I've been meaning to get him on the podcast actually to talk in detail. But he's I forget, I think he was called Nick something or other. He's like a you know a sleep doctor, you know, sleep expert. He's got a book out, and I was, remember a couple of the things he talked about at the time were um, like the importance of power naps, mm. uh, but also which I found quite interesting that we all have like different sleep clocks. I guess yeah. if that's the way, and that you know we we think uh, you know we all kind of have that pre-programmed natural we go to bed at whatever 10 mm. o'clock and we get up at six but um you know sometimes you know you're better off sleeping from 4 a.m until 11 a.m if, if that's if that's what suits you and yeah this. we have this inbuilt circadian rhythm in our brain i mentioned it a moment ago um nike head office allow you to work in accordance with your circadian rhythm so when you get these um night owls or like early birds it's a gen like it is a genuine scientific thing I think it's really interesting when you think about teenagers because teenagers circadian rhythm is shifted. So naturally they'd want to go to sleep later. So midnight onwards and then wake later. But we put teenagers through some of the most stressful exams and like high stake situations with exams starting at 9am, which to you and I might be the equivalent of 4am. Um, and so this circadian rhythm is really interesting. And I think, you know, as we've become a bit more flexible with working, I think more and more people will tap into that. Um, if you're someone who's really productive early, why can't you start work at 6am and finish at 3? Um, it's just these like societal norms of the working days, 9 to 5 or 9 to 6. I mean, I guess we talk about things like, you know, like sleep and exercise where it's people who are where it's something where people are not doing enough to help themselves mm. uh but let's take that the other way around for a minute and where we talk about people actually self-sabotaging you know with booze and with drugs and stuff i mean what, you know t tell me some of the um some of the effects i mean we all know that drink a lot you're going to feel hung over or you know mm. take it take a load of coke and your nose is going to fall out or something but i mean you know w from a from a, a medical perspective you know what what are some of the black and white bits of damage you're doing to yourself so talking about alcohol um, don't get me wrong. I'm someone that also enjoys a social drink. I think there's an element that a that's bit more than social. <laughs> some of your drinking. Oh yes, I'm sure you know about that. <laughs> um, so basically, alcohol is a depressant. So it makes you feel sleepy. Going back to sleep, people always think that you pass out after an episode of drinking, or you know, you have a glass of wine, you feel a bit tired. But actually, it really affects your sleep quality. So the next few days, you're going to feel more run down. Your immune system will be a little bit suppressed. Uh, but you might make bad decisions, be less quick with problem solving, not be switched on with memory. So, sorry to interrupt, but why do some people think that they need to have some booze to get to sleep, to sleep better then? Because it it is a suppressant, so it can make you drowsy. So it might help Temporarily. You. But Temporarily. Then, oh. So it might make you nod off easier. If someone's worried about something or they're very stressed and they use a glass of wine as a coping mechanism to help them get to sleep, it does do that. But actually when you're asleep, even if you get the same number of hours, the sleep quality isn't the same. It messes with your kind of cycle between deep... Um, and light sleep, you know, rapid eye movement mm -hmm. and non-rapid eye movement sleep. And so it affects your sleep. That's a huge one. Um, it can affect your ability to lose fat. If you, you know, we've talked a lot about people who are working out in the gym. The effect of alcohol on your metabolism is, first of all, alcohol contains calories. It contains lots of glucose. And so you're going to burn the alcohol first, which has doesn't really make you feel full. In fact, if I have a few drinks, it makes me want a pizza. So I end up eating more calories. But also it switches off your fat burning mechanisms. So if you're someone that's trying to lose weight, that one glass of wine that you think is innocent and you're counting the 100 calories for, it's actually much more complex than that. And then you get on to kind of the um, more psychological effects of alcohol and what it can do to your ability to think rationally it changes the way that we interact socially you know everyone's had that feeling of um reduced inhibition but there's dangerous territory i think when it becomes this this coping mechanism people off if i say the word alcoholic it's not a, a medical term as such but you think of someone who's drinking loads and getting themselves absolutely legless it could be that you are dependent on alcohol and you need to have a glass of wine every night i think that drinking regular alcohol comes with you know a really gray area as to when it becomes problematic of course you mentioned about doing drugs there's no health benefit to doing drugs obviously everyone has a choice to engage in whatever they want but um, if you are taking your health seriously 
nothing, you know, makes me laugh more than when you see someone sweating out at the gym Monday to Friday, drinking green juice, and then at the weekend smashing out some cocaine. It's just like, to me, it's just crazy. It's, it's, no, just, it's normally the yoga girls. So the, 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 the ones that are preaching about yoga on social media all I'm, week are the first one to the toilets on a Friday night. I'm not going to stereotype, but to me, that's just like this real clash of priorities. Um, but like, there's no judgment. It's just that I think we've make glamorized things a little bit and none of these behaviors are particularly healthy i think it's really interesting i was training for the marathon um at the beginning of last year and i drank way less so i would go to weddings and not drink because the next day i might have to get up and run 20 miles and people i found the response much easier to say oh i'm not drinking i've got a marathon training run tomorrow and people are like oh yeah all right Whereas now, if I said, oh, you know what, I'm not drinking tonight, someone goes, oh, go on, have a glass. Oh, why not? Alcohol's the only kind of drug that people judge you for not engaging with, which I think is interesting. Well, I've had this conversation a few times with people lately because, as I said a minute ago, you know, I've, I mean, I've not had, I've not had a drink for, let's say, say three weeks now. I say that in a way that might sound like I'm not mm. trying to say it's a lot or not a lot. I just haven't had a drink, drink for three weeks uh, because... I know that, you know, as I'm increasingly getting older, as much as I hate to admit it, uh, that even two or three glasses of wine really materially affects me. I mean, you know, like three weeks ago, Friday night, I'd gone out, I'd shared a bottle of wine, bottle of red, so what's that, three glasses max? Mm. Okay, I wasn't hungover, I wasn't pissed, but I was... I was definitely groggy the next day. I was slow. I was gro- and that's just from like three three glasses or you know, yeah. two or three glasses. So I try I try and not have it unless I really want to have it and I'm prepared you know prepared to take the consequences and pay the price. But I've had you know conversations with a lot of people who say yeah, I want to not drink, but it's very difficult for me because you know I'm in social settings mm-hmm. or it's because of my work environment. But I was look, I'm in that same work environment as you. You know I, I do oodles and oodles of socializing you know both daytime and nighttime for work Mm. where it would be very very easy for me to have drinks but you know I ultimately find that if I say I don't want to have a drink I mean look maybe it's because I'm strong enough to not give a shit what anybody says to me Mm. and and maybe because of that they therefore don't push me push it on me but I would say if someone's saying to you have a drink have a drink it's not a you problem it's a them problem yeah. it's because you know they've clearly got some issue where you know where they they can't not drink yeah and um you know i just think ultimately but i always if i'm pissed it's because i've drunk too much red wine i've never gone out to get pissed mm. that's why i always say you know if someone's drinking a vodka coke i said well i'll just drink a coke like as in you can't taste the vodka in the mm. coke because it's a vodka coke therefore i may as well just have the coke because mm. i've got i've got you know no interest in being pissed and no interest in being hung over if i'm going to be pissed and hung over it's going to be a byproduct of drinking it you're know, drinking a great a great bottle yeah. of wine and um i've kind of i've kind of uh forgotten where i was going with that <laughs> but um i think you know just you know whether or not people overthink it whether or not it's because um you know they're just trying to find an excuse you know not to drink because you've got deficiencies or issues issues elsewhere where where, where, where they need that alcohol confidence mm. but it's very when we talk about booze you know, when you look at the downsides of it, you know, in terms of of the hangover, the damage it does to your body, the fact that you know you, you you're probably angry, you probably you probably get pissed out of a bar fight, that someone mm. drink drives and kills someone. When you look at all the effect, all the negative effects of alcohol, as much as I would never want my red wine to be banned, I think if we just discovered alcohol today it'd be a prohibited substance. Mm. I mean, it's, it's only that it's been around for so so many years and there's so many people profiting off it that, yeah. that, that I think it, it, it gets to stay. Yeah, I think the social the social norm is strange. Like I said, it's like the only drug that you can take where people don't bat an eyelid mm. um, and judge you for not, not engaging with it. Um, I think there's, you know, an interesting question about, I feel like younger generations are turning more towards drugs rather than alcohol. I don't know the reasons for that. Um, but you no, know, alcohol is a really interesting one. I think if someone is like trying to take their health really seriously, you can't just see alcohol as like another part of your week. It needs to be a conscious um, thing that you engage in. Like you said, you want to open a lovely bottle of wine or you want to actively make a decision to have a social drink um, rather than just not even thinking about it. I always think that with anything, you need to like have intention. Um, If I'm, you know, if I'm eating a dessert, I'm like, I'm eating that dessert because I really want that dessert, not just because it's like this thing you do as part of a three course meal. So I've I've normally had too many starters and main courses and (laughs) and can't ever make it to a dessert. So talking about with intention, Mm -hmm. um, you're a marathon runner. 
we we, t- we talked about that a couple of times. But I mean, how did how did actually deciding to do the marathon come about? Because I know I know you're a passionate runner anyway. But d- did did you always have an aspiration to do a marathon, or did you just decide that halfway through your running journey? And I guess you know, tell tell us a bit about your training program. So I did not always aspire to do a marathon. I actually thought I was someone who would never be able to do it. I never thought that I was a runner. Um, I enjoy running mainly because it is this time in my week where I mentally switch off. Honestly, I think of nothing when I'm running. I don't even really listen to the music. Do you not listen to music? I do some... I can't run without music. I I sometimes have music, uh, particularly if I'm trying to maintain a speed on a training program just to keep the beat but I can easily run without music in fact I actually quite like listening to podcasts when I'm running I um, hope you're not listening to Stephen Bartlett while you're running. <laughs> my favorite podcast <laughs> um yeah so I never thought I'd be a marathon runner I used to go and watch the marathon and I remember watching it and thinking I could never do that and I was watching all of these people and honestly if you've ever watched the London marathon there is literally people from all backgrounds, all shapes and sizes, all ages, people with disabilities. And I just, I thought to myself, I can't, I could never do that. And then I watched it again and I thought, well, if they can do it, what is the difference? And it is the discipline of sticking to a training program. Um, So I applied, I actually ran for my hospital charity, Bart's Charity, which is much um, easier because you've got that motivation of knowing. And I've Pe- sponsored you, so you're you feeling guilty. You did very generously you know? sponsor me, thank you. Um, but you know that you're going to let people down if you don't stick to it. And then if you follow the training programme, I did a 16-week programme, it is amazing how your body adapts. Suddenly, you could, you know, when I first started running, I could not run 20 minutes without stopping. I probably couldn't run five minutes without stopping. And you follow a training program and all your kind of like metabolic processes adapt and you find yourself running an hour, an hour and a half. And it feels you know, easier than that first run you ever went on when you run five minutes. What, what's your average speed whilst you're running the marathon? My average speed was about um, five minutes 40 per kilometre. So I did it in just over four hours. So how many kilometres an hour is that? Um... I'm not sure. My maths is not good enough for that. <laughs> so I, it took me four hours and six minutes to okay. run um, 26.2 miles. If my laptop hadn't to run out of battery. I know, we could have worked we, it we, out. We it, was it. A, it was a decent speed. And and do you do you run the whole way? Did, was there any walking? Or? I didn't walk at all. In fact, I had planned to stop. I'd got loads of friends that came to support me, which was really lovely. And I thought, oh, when I see so-and-so, I'll stop and give them a hug and have a water. You know what? I just didn't stop. I found myself much more determined on the day than I thought I would be. And you asked, like, kind of why I ran a marathon. I do enjoy running, but that was a challenge. But I like pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I like having something to work towards and kind of proving to myself that I can do it. With anything, I get a little bit competitive. You know, I do um, F45 training, but now I would enter the odd fitness competition and just test myself and push myself that bit harder. Or I love training for a running race. I'm doing a half marathon in October. Or, you know, I get very competitive in our tennis matches. (laughs) So yeah, I think it's just nice to have a goal and you know get out of your comfort zone and I think push it's, yourself it's amazing what a difference that uh you know that goal or that motivator makes as well yeah. and i know you know we're talking uh we're talking uh you know chalk and cheese with my little 5k uh but just uh just using it for example's sake i mean uh, you know i mean, obviously never come close to a marathon but i, I used to used to do used to do lots of 5ks on the running machine just before i'd work out and i'm so slow i mean also if, if it was any slower i'd be going in reverse <laughs> and um you know i mean when i first started we were like 40 minutes to do 5k mm. and even even in my kind of glory days i was like you know 32 minutes you know 32 mm. minutes 29 minutes at best and uh, i'd not done much running for a while and a couple of months ago in dubai a friend of mine she asked me to you know just oh, go do, do that race I yeah saw. yeah to do the little 5k around the thing and you know she'd been getting all excited about it like are we going to do this together i'm like listen i said i don't like running with people i said you know you're either too fast or for me or too slow for me so i'm just i'm just gonna do my own thing and in my head i thought you know what if i can bring this in in under 30 minutes I'd be I'd be happy because you know it's kind of in line with where mm-hmm. I've been before and as soon as I started running she was a little bit ahead of me and I thought you know what I'll 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 just keep up with her pace unless it really kills me I'll just keep up with her pace and then when I'm getting halfway through I'm thinking right I'm 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 going to beat her that's 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 my new challenge and I was getting near towards the end when I thought that's when I'll I'll finally leg it and she broke like 100 meters ahead of me or something but I was conv- which I was convinced I was going to catch her in the last bit which I never did which you know p- still pisses me <laughs> off to this day but what was interesting is when I ran through when we ran through the thing I forget I think it was 
23, 23 minutes Amazing. or something. I'm thinking, how the fuck did that happen? Like, yeah. like you know, okay, I knew I went semi fastish by my standards, but never, you know, like I wasn't killing myself. I, you know, I, I didn't need to stop running. I think if I'd have actually put a little bit more effort in, I could have been, you know, 18, yeah. 18, 19 minutes. Then I saw like, you know, four year old kids doing it in like 15 minutes and I was, I was gutted. But no, you know, just, but just having having that that challenge, having, having, mm. having that motivator. Yeah, I think having a goal is important and everyone's goal will be different. I always have these short term goals like races or competitions, but ultimately we've spoken so much about the long term effects of exercise. My ultimate goal is to prevent disease happening to me or delay it as much as possible. Um, and so it's good to have short goals and then it's good to just, you know, remember that actually whether you'd run that in 35 minutes or 23 minutes, it doesn't matter. You did something that was challenging and you put the work in. That's actually what's important. Are you into ice baths? <laughs> I haven't particularly engaged with ice baths, but my brother lives by the coast in Cornwall. Oh, yeah. And whenever I go down there, I always make sure to get in the sea. Um, even if it's winter, I did go in the sea on Christmas Day. And I have to say, first of all, the science does support um, ice baths. But gosh, you feel amazing afterwards. Honestly, there is. it feels like you've just finished a run. It's kind of like we were saying about, you know, once you've finished an exercise, no matter how grumpy you may have been doing yeah. it, you can't help but feel better afterwards and people always say to me because i do a few ice baths i'm more into the cryo than the ice baths mm. but you know either way i do both and people always say to me well what's the benefits i'll say look i can tell you what the medical bits say and you know, mm. it says for for muscle recovery or for fat burning or for for better this better the other so i can't tell you if any of that's true or not but what i can tell you is i've never once come out of the ice bath or come out of the cryo and not felt like whoa you know like yeah. felt unbelievable ready to take on the world and also slept like a baby that night as well so yeah. i mean i am I'm an absolute, I've actually just ordered one for my for my apartment. I love it. But I, I just love that feeling of when you know you've pushed yourself through something uncomfortable. Often when I'm exercising, you know, when I'm at F45 on the rower, also not a big fan, I'm thinking to myself, it's meant to be uncomfortable. And I think you get a real rewarding feeling when you ever you challenge yourself like that. So let's talk about the glamorous stuff now. <laughs> so we've talked about um, the fact that you're, a, I guess, a, a, an influencer doctor. Uh, but, and, uh, I mean, you started to say how you were posting content, but how how did you make the the crossover to kind of commercialise that? And uh, and what, was that something that was, was an intent? A little bit of both. Um, when I started posting regularly as a doctor, I kind of found my niche. Um, there's lots of PTs on uh, Instagram and other f social media platforms that are way better than me, you know, more knowledgeable, in better shape, fitter than me. And I kind of realized that actually that isn't my space. Um, I lost interest a little bit with it, as I said, when I started working full time. But actually... I'm super interested in the evidence behind all aspects of healthcare and why we do things. And I started to post that, grew up a bit of a more kind of targeted following that I much more enjoyed engaging with. Um, and I basically got um, picked up by an agency and someone suggested to me, you know, you could oh, actually... They, they actually found you, it was like an accident. Yeah, so they approached me and said, you know, you could monetize this. And actually people don't realise the effort and expense of making content. So for me that kind of financial reward in the beginning was very small, but it was like, okay, this enables me to spend my day off making content instead of picking up an extra shift in the hospital. Um, and so it started off a little bit innocently like that, but actually there is a huge, um, a huge market for it now. And actually there's, you know, my answer to this is twofold. The first is that it's a great way to make an extra income. Um, being a junior doctor is not particularly financially rewarding. And because I do academic medicine, I don't work any out of hours. And that's where the bulk of your doctor's salary comes from. So um, it helped kind of supplement that um, and allows me to kind of have a passion project in my cancer research. But also, you know, more and more, we know people are going to social media for health advice. I think that, you know, YouTube is one of the most, um, or TikTok is when the majority of young people now go to when they have a health problem, like, why have I got this rash or uh, other things, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I want to talk about. And actually, I think as medics, I almost feel like a duty to put my knowledge on there because there's so much misinformation out there. So it's kind of this like positive um, balance where, 
I get so much personal reward from posting because I feel a real duty to do it. And I know the value added for people. Um, and I know it, some things are so confusing and there's so much dangerous information out there um, that I get so much reward from kind of bridging that gap. But also, um, yeah, you can commercialize it. And I don't agree with the saying that you need to turn your hobby into your job to be successful. But there is a lot of graft before you get any reward. Did you get did you get a lot of grief from from any other doctors? I mean, you you must have been a, a very junior junior doctor when you first started, and I'm sure there's plenty of people saying, "Well, you know, what do you yeah. know? You finished school three days ago." Yeah, I actually found that the hardest was the kind of trolling I got or negative feedback I got was always from doctors, um, often peers my age. I think the reasons for that are that first of all. I'm doing something that's not the norm. You know, I was on a conveyor belt of medical school. You graduate medical school, you do your foundation training, get on the conveyor belt of specialty training, become a consultant um, and, you know, keep yourself to yourself. And actually I've branched out to do something very different, putting myself in the public eye. You do, you know, expose yourself to scrutiny and criticism. But also I think for some people, and some people might not like me saying this, I think it triggers them because... There are so many attractive, articulate and very well-educated doctors that have so much knowledge to share. Are you saying you're attractive, articulate, educated doctor? I think you said that to me before I came on. <laughs> Wasn't that written on your introduction? Um, and they could do this, but they don't. And there's many reasons for that. Maybe they've got, you know, more shifts in the hospital or they've got a family or they've got other things going on, but they don't do it. But there's something in their brain that thinks I could do that. And so you trigger something in other people where... Um, maybe it's an insecurity or a bit of jealousy. And I'm okay with that. You know, I think there's space for loads of doctors to do this. And if anyone listening kind of feels like they're on the cusp of of creating a medical Instagram page, do it. Because there is so much misinformation out there that the more doctors that step up and start, um, and other, other healthcare professionals as well, putting their information on social media, the better. Because um, we really need to target the crap out there. With the trolling, did you always find it easy to deal with or, or did it upset you at the beginning? And, and I guess even though now we talk about the fact that why do people troll? Well, you know, it probably just simply boils down to jealousy. I mean, I've, you know, I've never known a non-jealous troll. You know, again, it's like we talk about you know, the, the alcohol thing. You know, trolling isn't a you problem. It's a, it's a, it's a them problem. Uh, but I guess for some people, that still doesn't make it any easier when you see nasty comments said about yourself. I mean, you know, did you, did you shed a tear in the beginning? You know, it's really interesting because as humans, we always pick up on the negative thing. So you could post a piece of content and get 50 lovely comments, of people saying how much value it's added to them, how much they love it, how much they enjoyed it. And then you get one bad comment and you just naturally fixate on that. And you think, oh, they didn't like this. Maybe I did that wrong. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm only human. I don't, I can't say that I let negative comments completely, you know, just pass me by without any effect. One thing I really had to deal with was when people completely misinterpret you or take things out of context. I got some kind of trolling in the early days where maybe I'd film a video and I would have got to work early to film the video or I would have spent my lunch break doing it and then they would post me like oh she's doing that in work hours or she's skiving and I think oh you know that's really unjust like I got up early to do that and that used to really bother me but now to be honest I feel lucky I don't I think because I do take a little bit of a step back personally on it. Um, I don't get particularly much trolling. I'm still very small. I'm sure if I grew, I'd be exposed to more. But now I've been, mu I'm much better at dealing with it. I think you kind of have to have a bit of a thick skin to go into this anyway. Um, if you take criticism really to heart, then a social media presence is probably not the right avenue to go on. Um, but yeah, no, I, st I still would, you know, I don't just dismiss all negative feedback. I think sometimes people are saying things that are legit and you've got to also hear other points of view, but um, it's not going to stop me doing what I'm doing. It's funny, it's funny you say, um, you know, you, you, you don't get, get as much now, you don't, don't get as much, you know, maybe you will as you grow. I always say to myself that, um, you know, I don't get enough trolling mm. because uh, it, it means, you know, if I was getting, getting more trolling, because obviously the ratio is always 
better nice comments than to negative mm. comments. I always think I want to get trolled. I want to get trolled because if I'm getting more trolling, it means I, it means I'm getting more positive comments. Then you need which, to get on TikTok which, which because people, people on TikTok are savage. <laughs> That's that is actually where I had had my probably most trolled time, and I I I, I just love, I think it's just you know such good banter, and I always you know reply with some yeah. funny comment or what well, I think's funny anyway, uh, and then you know and end up resharing them. But I remember doing a, 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 a I put a video on, and it was so it was so not my style really, but to, you know, I've got quite a few friends who were, you know, quite big YouTube stars or, or you know, crypto uh, Instagram influencers mm. and stuff. And and uh, you know, I, I get advice from them about how to how to do things, uh, you know, different or how to how to grow my channel, etc. Um, but I remember um, one day, you know, one of them would come to have dinner with me, and he said, "Oh, I've just been uh, just been in Louis Vuitton, just you know, just filming some content." I was like, "What? You've been filming yourself shopping?" And he said, "He said, yeah, yeah." I said, "Fuck it, now." He goes, "You should be doing this stuff, you know." He said, "You know the." All the lifestyle stuff we do, which gets all the shares, mm. it gets all the you know, gets all the views. You know, it's only the kind of stuff you do every day, but you just do it and don't film it. Mm. I was like, yeah, but it's just, it's just not my style. Like, like, like obviously, I'm, I'm not low key by anyone's stretch, but it's also not like my style to be bouncing on the bonnet of a Ferrari, mm. saying, yeah, I used to be skint and now I now I drive a Ferrari. Um, but I thought, you know what, I'll I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Uh, and a few weeks later, I was um, I'd, I'd bought Elena a watch. I remember. Do you remember this, right? And and I I was um I was due to I was giving her anyway. She genuinely didn't know about it. I thought, you know what, I'll 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 make I'll make a video about it and uh, and 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 you know see see how it see how it performs. You know, take some advice from these guys. So I filmed it secretly, uh, put the video up, and I, and I did all the stuff that I'd never normally do. So like the videos emblazoned with like you know I bought my girlfriend a seventy five grand watch and me smiling and you know it's, it's saying all all the all the buzzwords and the cheesy stuff. But fucking hell, did it perform? I mean, I mean, I mean, like li- literally within within. 10 seconds 10 minutes of the video being up there it had had, it had, had more more engagement than every one of my videos you know put together yeah. and within like you know within 24 48 hours we're talking you know, a thousand comments you know two three hundred hundred likes so a hundred thousand likes um but like you say the 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 amount of trolling uh, mm. on TikTok was like next next level. But then I for me I always like look at it and laugh about it and you know it's comments like, well, you know, um I wonder why that, you know, 27 year old girls with him. I'm like, well, like I give a fuck, you know <laughs> like, like, like who's winning? Uh, and I think, you know, as long as as long as you're not a weak person, you've just got to look at it as um uh, as, as jealousy and it's it's just yeah. so easy to get past yeah I always find it quite a difficult balance um to strike myself because obviously I'm posting really kind of objective health information so you know that it, that isn't personal preference um what I'm saying is fact so you can not like the way I'm presenting the information but you can't deny that the information I'm giving is truthful but then I also do share aspects of my life because I think like you just said people want to People do want to see the lifestyle stuff. People don't want me to preach to them that you need to be exercising. They want to see how I fit that into a busy life or, um, you know, how sometimes I have a bad day or I skip a workout. I think it's much more palatable and kind of accessible if you also show a bit of human behind it. Absolutely. But you've got to try it. Like, it's all trial and error. And I think sometimes you just get held to this really high like unachievable, unsustainable standard by people and you slip up once and then people just go as if like you know that was that's their opportunity to troll um whereas I always think my intention behind this is good I'm trying to share my knowledge I enjoy talking I enjoy conversations like this I enjoy creating content and I know it helps some people if I make a video talking about breast checking for breast cancer awareness and it makes one person check their breasts and they detect something that was worth it whether I got two views or 20,000 views so what's um what's been some of your I guess most enjoyable moments that that, that have come from your your more um, social media and um, I guess you know media in general side because you, you you've got uh, you've been doing some TV work as well yeah I mean any any key things where where they've been super fun or that you know has really made it worthwhile I think the there's two things I enjoy the most I love public speaking opportunities I read so much and I'm such a nerd deep down that I love kind of processing that information and then delivering it to people so I love doing panel talks or hosting talks and things like that I love coming on podcasts I'm actually starting my own podcast in a few weeks plug um, plug <laughs> and also 
the opportunity to meet people that are really interesting and have really interesting conversations, they're the kind of two most fun things. You know, every time I get a slot on TV, which I still get super excited about, it's really good because it makes me read up on that topic. So I'm constantly learning. I get to have be interviewed or interview really interesting people um, and learn things myself. So yeah, for me, I enjoy that side more than the, you know, filming a video at home. I mean, when you talk about learning and reading, because um, obviously I know, you know, from a personal perspective that, you know, you're, you're a big reader, you know, you, and you're always like learning new things from, you know, from not just medical, but from all kinds of different areas. How does it, how does it work with doctors? Because, um, you know, I mean, I know I've seen like a, the same GP for, not anymore, but like, you know, a few years ago, I'd see a GP who must be 60 plus years old. Mm. And the guy's clearly never done anything new, any new medical learning since the day he left medical school, like mm. 40, 40, 40 years earlier. Um, and, you know, you'll be asking him about uh, a particular kind of treatment or something that, you know, you've heard of and you want to ask a doctor for, and he's not got a clue because, mm. you know, he's, 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 no, he's never le learned anything new. I mean, how, how, how does that work with doctors? You know, it's, it, you know, it's a, again, leading question because from a work perspective, you know, in my business, you know, I always give my staff grief that, you know, how, how can you, you know, get better as an accountant? How can you get better as an underwriter or a salesperson or whatever you're doing, you know, unless you're, you're constantly learning, unless mm. you're, you're finding new things, because whilst the key principles may remain the same you know there's always going to be new, new techniques and think things evolve over time and i guess nowhere is that more important for us because it's live or die type stuff than mm. the, the medicine i mean how, how does that work my experience is actually very different from that i think that um my experience of working in healthcare has been that graduating was just the beginning you're actually faced with years of um, more exams so i've done three exams since i graduated five years ago that um not only force me to keep up the knowledge I learned, but acquire a lot more knowledge, so more specialist training. Um, but also you have to keep a portfolio. So every year I have to present a portfolio to um, show what I've learned, to show kind of the continued professional development that I've attended congresses, that I've been on courses, that I've done exams, to be able to pass and progress. So um, yeah, I definitely don't know the experience of that doctor in particular, but I think the kind of generation of doctors I'm in, there's um, a lot of um, support around continued learning. And I think as well, you know, doctors like myself that go onto the media probably have an interest in that because I'm reading topics all the time. I work in cancer, but a lot of the stuff I post on social media might be more general practice based, you know, talking about um, some aspects of women's health or fertility or blood pressure. They're not necessarily things that I do in my day job, um, but I've got a personal responsibility to read up on those. So I guess it varies from individual to individual. It's, you can't just put... Um, you know, one doctor in the whole bracket of medicine um, as the standard, because it's the same as like an entrepreneur in the field of business. Everyone's different and has different independent learning, don't they? No, for sure. And um, in terms of, I guess, in terms of learnings and awards, you were nominated for a NHS uh, Bart's Hero Award. I won the NHS oh, you, Bart's you won Hero it. Award. Yeah. yeah. That was more for my fundraising and charity work um, that I did with the marathon and supporting their um, social media content and things. But yeah, that was a really, a really nice award to win. So future of healthcare yeah. and the NHS particularly, um, you know, I, I promise not to ask anything controversial, but uh, you know, you can, you can be controversial or not with it. I mean, the, the NHS is something that um, I guess is, is very, very polarizing in, in terms of people's mm. opinions and probably like most opinions, you know, their opinions are given by people who haven't really got a clue what they're talking about anyway. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, you t t tell me, tell me, tell me the good and bad, you know, what, uh, what, what you would be doing if you were combining your desire to be an entrepreneur and a doctor in want to you know to fix a system that may be broken and uh, you know what can the future hold for us yeah i think the nhs is a really um a really topical one at the moment i think it's designed in a way that is it's a wonderful scheme it is one of the best healthcare systems in the world but it isn't designed on today's population you know we have an aging population so we're all living longer which means we have more opportunity to develop disease we all have much worse lifestyle habits we smoke more, we drink more, we sleep less, we eat worse food, um, we're more inactive. And so the NHS will need to adapt to treat and serve the population, which is changing. Um, and I think one of the things that's going to be difficult is leaving behind certain things that are now outdated to be able to serve future populations. And I don't know what that looks like. 
one thing I would do if I had any say in how uh, money was spent and things is focusing more on prevention. I work so much in cancer and a lot of uh, a lot of research into uh, treating cancer but a lot of my personal interests lie in prevention of disease which I hope's come across with all of the lifestyle things I've talked about and you know the NHS budget only 5% of the NHS budget is spent on disease prevention and I think if we can prevent the diseases occurring cancer high blood pressure obesity all of these it's much more cost effective than treating it and so I hope that with a shift, um, and I think there will be a shift over the next kind of five to 10 years. Um, I hope more focus is on prevention um, and realizing that medicine isn't just prescribing a pill um, to treat a disease. It should be looking at the whole lifestyle factor. One of my favorite quotes is that um, if exercise were a drug, it would be the most widely prescribed drug of all time. And I think that's true. But when you get a 10 minute slot with your GP and you come in with a complex problem, it's very difficult to, you know, talk about all of these complex issues rather than just prescribe you a tablet. And you, you talk about prevention and uh, this is maybe more of a, more of an American um, say, say theory or maybe a conspiracy theory, but you, know, you certainly hear about it more in the, in the U S than you do in the UK. But I mean, you know, people often talk about the fact that medicine doesn't want you to prevent because it's, it's an, it, ultimately it's not really the healthcare industry, it's the pharmaceutical industry and the, you know, the pharmaceutical companies want you to stay ill because that's how they're going to keep making money. And See, I find this really hard to listen to because I work very closely with pharmaceutical companies. So I work in clinical trials. So they will develop a new cancer drug and we will run the trial from our center and as will, you know, 50 other sites globally. And they are all racing to develop new drugs to treat these cancers. So it is in their interest to cure disease because if you're the drug company that produces a more effective cancer drug that makes people live longer, that becomes the drug that's given. So actually, we need the far, we need the financial incentive of the pharmaceutical companies to develop these drugs in the first place, and so I don't I don't agree with the stance that they never want you to get better. But I guess what I guess what people are saying, <laughs> because yes, obviously if you've if you've got something that needs fixing, of course it makes sense to have the the best solution mm. to that problem. But I guess what they're saying is, if the real answer was to run more and eat more grapes mm. in the first place and therefore not you know not get the you know, that would cure the sorry that would but that doesn't need a pharmaceutical industry no exactly exactly that exactly. needs a government that is investing in public health measures to you know better education um and better support for doing those preventative things but i guess the argument is that the the pharmaceutical companies are effectively lobbying the government to 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 keep them away from prevention and more on to cure I'm not sure how much truth is in that statement. I think pharmaceutical industries are businesses. They are looking at opportunities to make money. And if that is in treating a disease that exists, so be it. Um, I'm not sure what happens behind the scenes, deals that are made. I don't think you really know whatever goes on with the government. But um, I don't think, I think that's kind of shifting the blame. I think there needs to be a massive restructure and review of budgets and priorities. And sometimes I think even with budgeting, we get so bogged down in, again, the tiny little details of things um, and aren't focusing on the fundamentals. Every time, you know, we get a new generation of children, you have an opportunity to change the health of that generation. If you think about smoking, I don't really know anyone of my age that smokes now, whereas I'm sure 20 years they ago... They all vape instead. <laughs> they all vape instead, that is true. But everyone smoked. And so change just takes time. Um and unfortunately, just like we said earlier, people like quick fixes. Um, and, but it's going to need a real shakeup, I think, to be able to support the you know very ever-growing needs of our population. Well, shake up or no shake up, I'm sure we're going to enjoy watching your face uh, <laughs> take take us uh, take us along the journey over over the next few years. Listen, Frankie, it's been uh, super fun to talk. I hope I've uh, been pretty painless for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were less controversial than I was expecting. Good, good. I've been on my best behaviour. Listen, you, you talked about a podcast coming out, and for, for anyone who doesn't know you already, just uh, give yourself a little shout out. Where can we, you know what what are your social handles, and where can we find you? So I'm mainly on Instagram. My handle is at Dr Frankie JS, and my podcast should be launching in September. It's called Vision of Health, and I hope you'll tune in.
Cool, cool. Well, listen, Frankie, thanks a lot for being here. Guys, as always, I am the Matt Haycox on all things social. That's T-H-E-M-A-T-T-H-A-Y-C-O-X. If you've been watching this on YouTube, you can listen to the audio versions on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. If you've been listening to the audio version, come and see my pretty face and come over onto YouTube too. Until the next time, thank you very much for listening or watching. <laughs>